Hey, what a joy it is this morning. Uh, many of you know Pastor Ryan and Lauren are still on their much-needed two-week vacation, and they'll be back next week. If they're not back next week, that is not on me. They're supposed to be back next week. So I'm just telling you, they should be here next week. I know they've had a great few weeks, and I'm honored uh, to get the opportunity to open the Scriptures with you today. We've been in this series walking through the book of James, and at least for me personally, and I know I've talked to some of you, you, you agree, it's, it's been challenging and convicting and encouraging. And I've reflected a lot. And one thing I've reflected on is I want my life to matter. Like, I want my life to make a difference. And I think somewhere at some place deep within us, this is a yearning built into all of our hearts. I mean, most of us would agree we've had that thought. Our lives are meant for something. We long to live deeply, fully, faithfully connected to that meaning. We hunger to live from meaning, for meaning, on purpose, on mission. This runs in all of us. Now, I used to imagine that this was best realized in making my life big. Surely the, big, the greatest impacts happen in the grandest ways. Doing big things, like being known, starting something significant and massive and world-changing. And maybe God assigns people to that for sure. But the greatest, grandest, most world-changing paradigm has already been unleashed in the earth. And it's the kingdom of God that has broken in through Jesus. It is perfect love poured out for all humanity. This is what our lives are meant for. Our lives are meant for love, God's love. Not just any love, God's love. I think deep down we all know, as much as human greatness impresses us, human greatness will never change the world. I'm reading uh, Chernow's biography about Alexander Hamilton right now. These founding fathers were impressive, okay? But even at its best, human greatness won't really, fully, truly, deeply change the world. If you want your life to matter, it doesn't have to be big. It must become love. That's how it matters. The very love of Jesus coursing through your every day, your every conversation, your every dream, desire, and plan. The love of God extended to the poor, the broken, the forgotten, the famous and the wealthy, the homeless and the Hollywood star, the widow, and the family that we look at down the street and wish we had what they had, the overlooked orphan, and the one who's applauded in popularity. It is God's love poured out for all. This is why Jesus says in John 13, 35, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Not if your life is big, not if you're super successful, not if you start a nonprofit that changes if you love one another. We were made by love and for love and from love to love. We were made by love and for love and from love to love. I want you to hear these words from Dallas Willard and Gary Black. This is from The Divine Conspiracy Continued. It's a, it's a sequel to Dallas Willard's The Divine Conspiracy, which I highly recommend. As disciples of Jesus, following in his footsteps, listening to the Spirit's ever-present counsel, we are to facilitate and lead a humble, peaceful, wise, and loving festival of goodwill. Very willardy to say it that way. The result which will overwhelm every competing agenda. Oh, thank God. Every fearful scheme and every desperate plan founded on the shifting sands of human fear or pride. Get this. It is a revolution of loving kindness. It is a revolution of loving kindness. Today, I, I want to talk to you from the book of James with this title, God's Revolution of Loving Kindness. Let's pray. Jesus, we're here totally dependent on you. God, we need you. We yearn for you. God, we're not here for performance or applause. We're not here, Lord, to display anything about ourselves. We're not here to check off the box of religious duty for the week. We're here for you, Jesus. Only you can transform us. You are worth it all. So may we find you as the treasure. May we find you as our portion today, Lord. 
Spirit of God, open every heart, open every mind to receive your word today, to receive hope in you, challenge, conviction, and joy in the beauty of who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm going to do a really quick, quick recap because I hate recaps, right? No one likes recaps. I skipped the recap on, like, TV, okay? But last week, we looked at James 2, verses 1 through 7 from the idea of playing favorites, and James talking about how our tendency is to play favorites. And, and so I told you we had five simple points that were crafted as invitations to action. Last week, we did points one and two. This week, we'll do the final three. And so last week, we looked at two things. One, stop favoring people. Pretty clear. Clearly what James is talking about. And second, receive God's heart for the poor. And we spent a, a little time looking at God's heart of compassion, this Greek word, splontnizomai, it's his gut-wrenching, bowel-aching compassion. And we asked for his heart. James actually begins this topic at the end of chapter 1, when he writes in verse 27, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Then, James goes on to discuss a primary way in which the church was being polluted by the world, showing favoritism and dishonoring the poor. Now, James is going to explain why this is so important and what you and I are called to do about it. Now, I'm going to admit to you, there is a lot here, okay? I'm going to try to do a lot in a short amount of time. We get into some moderately challenging theological issues today, which I think is pretty fun. But I don't want to simply brush past them, nor do we have time to, like, take a deep dive into them. So I'm going to try to do my best to walk us through this text in a way that will hopefully prove instructional as well as practical. We need both. Because these aren't just truths to learn, they're truths to live, which is the very point James is about to hammer home. So... Here's our point one for today. If you want to put three in your notes because of last week, that's fine. I just put one because I had to. It's a different sermon. Okay, leave me alone. Number one, live the law of love. Live the law of love. Let's pick up in verse eight, which is where we left off last week. James chapter two, verse eight. You guys with me? Okay, we're going there today. Here we go. Verse eight. If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. We're going to stop right there. The royal law, love your neighbor as yourself. What is this royal law? Okay, this can be kind of confusing. This is not the Ten Commandments. It's not even the Old Testament law in general. The royal law is best understood, and we have this for you here, as the overarching characterization of God's will for Christians. This is the royal law. It is revealed particularly in Jesus in his life, his teachings, his commands, and his ways. So the royal law, with this, the point isn't a program of legalistic rules or a list of do's and don'ts, though those lists exist in the New Testament, and they're important. But the point that Jesus makes, and that Paul makes, and here that James makes, is that everything God commands of us, and everything to which he calls us, has at its core Christ-like love. This is the royal law, not the list. Christ-like love. All the law and the prophets, Jesus says, are summed up and hang upon this, loving God and loving neighbors. Which means the law of love is now what motivates our thoughts, desires, and deeds. It's the law of love that motivates us. Not like, did I do that exactly the right way? We're led by love. We're led by the Lord's voice. We're led by the Spirit convicting, challenging, and prompting us. We all agree everyone wants to be loved, right? You want to hear not want to be loved? You're like, actually, I'm good without it. We all want to be loved. And I think we all could say, I love. I mean, we all love someone or even something. The question isn't, do I love? There are actually two crucial questions, though. And the first is, who do I love? The second is, how? How do I show it? James is going to deal with both of these. Jesus deals with both of these, and James is taking a cue from the Master Jesus, and he's dealing with both of these, which takes us back to the original sticky question. 
the one that the Pharisees tried to stick on Jesus. Who is my neighbor? Remember, the, the royal law of love is love your neighbor as yourself. But who is my neighbor? Well, we can say it pretty plainly this way. A neighbor is anyone who needs my care and attention. Anyone who needs. This is why Jesus tells the parable of the Good Samaritan. It blew all their boxes and boundaries out of the way. But here's the truth. You and I can't care for every needy person in the world. So how can we be a neighbor to all the needs? We can't. So let's bring it closer to home. A neighbor is any person with whom we might come into contact. Because every person can somehow, in some way, need our care and attention. So a neighbor isn't just anyone who might possibly have a need anywhere in the world. That's too much for us to bear. But it is any person with whom we might come into contact. That we can respond to. So because the question is sticky, and because my propensity is to do what the Pharisees did and find my way out of this situation, I'm going to answer some realistic ways to the question, who is my neighbor? Okay, your neighbor might be your coworker, who is actually hoping you'll fail so he or she can get promoted. That's your neighbor. My neighbor is the coupon person at the grocery store who I'm stuck behind. <sighs> That's my neighbor. My neighbor is a foreigner and an immigrant, even an illegal one. Jesus doesn't put the boundary on well, they're not your neighbor if they did something wrong. If that's the case, we're all doomed because he came for us who'd done it all wrong. Your neighbor is your political enemy. Ouch. Even the one on Facebook. Well, I don't like Facebook. Book face. Thank you, the office. Your neighbor is those who think differently, believe differently, behave differently. Your neighbor is the one with the pride flag out front of their house. Your neighbor is the one with the Trump or Biden flag out front. Your neighbor is the one with the Boston Celtics flag out front. I'm not bitter. You are. Oh, stop it right now. I'm kidding. I love you, neighbor. Won't you be mine? Your neighbor is the Karen down the street who keeps getting on the next door app to rip people up and report every possible violation to code enforcement, including the basketball goal innocently placed on the curb. I'm not bitter, you are. Your neighbor is the parent at your kid's sports game who is irate and yelling at the refs, maybe even yelling at your kid. My neighbor is the homeless person at the corner of the intersection at 635 Northwest Highway. My neighbor is the family in my midst who is struggling to make ends meet, to get their kid school clothes, to put groceries in the pantry and the fridge. Your neighbor is the awkward kid who has a difficulty grasping social norms. My neighbor is the girl who smells bad because her water at home has been turned off since her single mom working two jobs couldn't make the payment, and now she's bathing using baby wipes before coming to school. That's a true story. That's my neighbor. Your neighbor is the kid in class who you think is just a troublemaker, but he's actually exhausted because he sleeps on the couch in his tiny overcrowded apartment where there is a constant flow of traffic all night long of people who don't care much about him at all. They're more interested in parties and drugs, but he has school the next morning and he probably ate dinner from a gas station. Also, true story. My neighbor is the waiter at lunch who has a bad attitude and keeps making mistakes. But I tip them, not because of who they are, but because of who I want to be. I tip them not based on the job they do, but because the one who's worth it all came and served me, even when I wasn't worth it. Here's what we find. No individual is excluded from being a neighbor. And no Christian is excluded from the call to kingdom neighborliness. That is the royal law. That's why it's so comprehensive. That's why it's the law of love. Jesus doesn't actually limit and minimize it. He expands the category. He says, you've heard, but I say. You thought just this, but I'm telling you the law of love actually demands more of your life, not less. And it's not just the big things. It's the small things too, which is precisely the next point James makes. Look at the next verse. James chapter 2, verse 9. You guys still with me? Okay, halfway. Verse 9. 
But if you show favoritism, so we're back to his, his earlier point, the beginning of the chapter. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, of course God, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Now, let's dig into this for a minute. I'm about to make a statement that for some of you will be shocking. And that's because we've heard so much improper interpretation of this passage and incorrect teaching on the nature of sin. You ready? Despite what you've heard, not all sin is equal. Not all sin is equal. It's not what James is teaching here, and it's not at all what Scripture teaches elsewhere. I'm about to prove it to you. All sin is against God's nature. All sin is against God's desire and design for humanity, but not all sin is the same. To quote a, a, a pastor friend and spiritual mentor of mine, Brian Jarrett, every act of sin is not equally heinous before God. Let me give you three reasons why. Number one, and this is probably a little bit more content than I would give this section, but I know some of you are going, what? Heresy. I'm going to prove to you. First of all, there are higher and lower moral laws. Okay, Jesus talks about the weightier or more important matters of the law in Matthew 23. He talks about the least commandments in Matthew 5 and the greatest commandment in Matthew 22. A least and a greatest. It's graded. We're commanded also to obey governing authorities. But we must obey God over those authorities. In fact, we might have to disobey a governing authority lower moral law, to obey God, higher moral law. We see this with Rahab, who James mentions at the end of this chapter. The Israelite spies come in to spy out Jericho, and the king sends guards and says, hey, we know they're here. Where are they? She flat out lies, bold-faced lies and misdirects to the governing authorities. Why? Because of the higher moral law of preserving life. We see higher and lower moral laws. Here's the second thing we see. There are greater and lesser sins. Jesus told Pilate that Judas had committed the greater sin than what Pilate was committing by handing him over. That's in John 19. There's clearly a differentiating of the severity here, the greater sin. Jesus compares the difference in some sins as that between a speck in one person's eye and a plank in the other person's eye in Matthew 7. Clearly, a speck is small, a plank is big. Or he tells the Pharisees that they're straining out gnats while swallowing camels in Matthew 23, meaning they're fussing about the small sins in others while committing the larger sins themselves. And then here's the third reason why. We see that there are greater and lesser judgments. In 1 John 5.16, he talks about sins that lead to death and sins that do not lead to death. In James 3.1, he says that, which is right here in James, a few verses later, those who teach will be judged more strictly. Why? Because those in authority and those who teach have a higher responsibility. So the implications of their moral wrongdoings are greater. They're judged more strictly. And then in Mark 3.29, we see the mention of the unforgivable sin of blas blaspheming the Holy Spirit. There are forgivable sins, and then there's this one unforgivable sin. Not all sin is equal. Norman Geisler, a biblical scholar and a Christian philosopher, says this in his book, Christian Ethics. The common myth that all sins are equal is often based on erroneous interpretations of James 2.10. Huh, that's where we are today. Which does not speak of the equality of all sins, but rather, get this, of the unity of the law. So then, here is James's point. God's royal law of love is a unified whole. And if we break it for any reason, whether showing favoritism, dishonoring the poor, adultery, or murder, we violated the law of love. The point is we can't say, yeah, but I've done all these things, but showing favoritism, I'm still good. His point is no. 
If you've done this one, you've broken the law of love, the whole thing. It's a unified whole. You can't keep 99 of them, break one of them, and say, I'm not a lawbreaker. It makes us lawbreakers. We've gone against God's desire and design. We've gone against divine love. Not too long ago, I was tucking in one of my daughters at nighttime, and we're having a little conversation, and it escalated quickly. And it turned into a full-on confrontation. And she responded to me in a way that was inappropriate. It was rude. And I went like two to ten. I went full-on dad mode. You know, like, my, my register went down four and a half octaves. I began to overly dictate and separate every single thing. You listen to me right now. Hush, I do not want to hear it. If you say one, let me show you, right? Just like that. And I'm, and I'm telling her why she's wrong. And she, man, head under the blanket. You look, you look at me in the eyes when I'm talking to you. Lord have mercy. So I tell her why she was wrong and justify my tone and leave. And I go back into the living room with my wife. And in a few minutes, I'm like, okay, I need to go talk to her. So I go back in. She's under the covers. I said, hey, sweetie, can I talk to you? I'm, I'm calmer. My tone's a little calmer. So I begin to tell her, like, hey, the way you responded was inappropriate. It was not right. I'm your father. Show me authority. And then again, because I just couldn't resist myself, I justified my harshness. I justified not just that I was disciplining her, but the way I was disciplining her. I talked. It was calmer, but the damage was done. I prayed for her. I tucked her in. Went back into the living room. But I was eaten up inside and I heard her crying in her bed. Finally, after a little while, I just couldn't stand it anymore, and I'm like, I'm going to try one more time, and this time I'm going to repent. And I went in there, and she had fallen asleep. She cried herself to sleep. And I slept horribly that night. I couldn't get it out of my mind that I sent her to bed that way. I sent her to bed that way. I violated the law of love. See, we can do the right thing and do it wrongly. And even that is breaking the whole law. This is why we can't wiggle ourselves out. Oh, I'm fine. I was justified in my discipline. But I was wrong in the way that I did it. See, when God begins to give us greater convictions in smaller areas, we see all the ways that we can become more like Jesus. More loving, more neighborly. And we participate in God's revolution of loving kindness. I have a responsibility to shepherd her heart. And I failed to do it. I was so right about what I was doing, I violated love. And here why, here's why this matters for us. The demands of love are greater than we imagine. And yet, they happen in smaller ways than we tend to realize, like disciplining at bedtime. Mother Teresa says this, Not all of us can do great things, but we can do small things with great love. God doesn't require us all to do great things for him. But he, I would go farther than Mother Teresa. He commands us to do small things with great love. Not just we can, we're commanded to do it. The Pharisees and religious teachers wanted to excuse themselves from being neighborly. They wanted to abide by the list of rules, but they were failing to show kindness, to do mercy and justice. Look, if you and I want to find loopholes, we can. We probably can make some loop- loopholes. I can tell myself that the poor person is probably going to also be a poor steward of my resources, so I'm not going to share. Maybe he'll sell the coat I donate. Maybe he'll give the groceries to someone else or sell them for drugs. I can probably find a way out of love. I can try to find my way out if I want. But the call of Jesus is to find my way in. I'm going to say that again. I can find my way out if I want. But the call of Jesus is to find my way in, into his heart, into his love, into the depths of his compassion, into the danger and risk of caring for another in need. It was dangerous for the Good Samaritan to do what he did. Into loving my neighbor as myself. Live the law of love. Here's our second point. I know this is 
kind of tough. It's been tough for me these past two weeks. <laughs> and I told you why last week. If you weren't here last week, I encourage you, if you want, go listen to that sermon. If you never want to hear it, that's fine too. I'm not offended. James chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. Next verses. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Interesting, like, connection of ideas. Judged, but law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. And here's the kicker. This is beautiful. Thank you, James, for giving us a breath for a second. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Everyone say mercy triumphs. Thank God. (laughs) Mercy triumphs over judgment. This law that gives freedom is, James, he's not introducing something new. It's the same thing. It's the law of love, the royal law of love. If we speak and act as those judged by the law that gives freedom, then we are those who are merciful because it's what the freedom of love demands. Mercy. The freedom of love demands mercy. That's how Jesus came, to set us free in his love. How did he set us free? Through mercy. It means we are also setting people free in God's revolutionary love working through us. Here's the point. Get this. Because God's mercy triumphs over judgment, our mercy must triumph over judgment. That's what James is saying, like explicitly. That one's not up for interpretation. It's flat out. Because God's mercy triumphs over judgment, our mercy must triumph over judgment. Here's the hard part. It's not just judgment generically. If we look at James's entire argument, mercy must triumph even over our tendency to judge. Even over our tendency to judge. Okay, I'm going to set some of you at ease. The mercy of God and the justice of God are not in conflict. As a perfect divine being, it is essential that God be both perfectly just and perfectly merciful. Justice was satisfied in Jesus, and then mercy transferred that satisfaction of justice to us. He who knew no sin became sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Or as the old hymn says, because a sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the judge was satisfied to look on him and pardon me. What about for us, though? We are called to replicate this divine pattern in how we think about and act towards others. That's what James is driving at. God set up a divine pattern. He released it over our lives, and then commands us to do it too. Let me set some of you at ease again. Because I know the wheels are turning. Maximizing mercy doesn't mean we're minimizing sin. It means that however great the sin, the mercy is greater. This is important. Like, ah, Dude, your sin's not a big deal. It is. It's against the heart and design and desire of God for you. We're not minimizing it. But maximizing mercy says, however great the sin or small the sin, the mercy is greater. So when our default is to pronounce judgment, let's choose to be like Jesus and show mercy. Let's speak and act as ones liberated by the law of love. Do mercy. All right, my final point, point number three. I'm going to get a sip of water. Because if I didn't announce that to you, you wouldn't know what I was doing in that moment. What? Something changed. Any Brian Regan fans in the house? Hey, let's go. My Brian Regan people. Okay, final portion of this chapter. Now, I was originally going to, um, oh, did I tell you point number three? Number three, put your faith to work. Number three, put your faith to work. I told you action statements. We've got five of them over the course of these two weeks. Put your faith to work. This is the final portion of chapter two. Originally, I was going to preach only this portion of the text today. But the more I studied and prepared these consecutive sermons, 
the more I realize that James is putting a big final stamp on his thoughts with these verses. There are some new ideas, but it's one whole. He crescendos this entire discussion into a powerful ending. So, verse 14, we're going to finish out this chapter here. You guys with me? All right, we're, we're, we're landing the plane in the next few minutes. We may circle the airport once or twice, but we're landing the plane. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds or works? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. So we're back into our theme of the poor. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? Saying, what good are your words? What good are your sentiments? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, and here he's, creating this little argument, this, this dialogue, okay, with his interlocutor. That's a fun word there, okay, just his op- opponent in logic. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. He's saying, you can't show me that. <laughs> it's impossible. Verse 19, and he makes his case. You believe that there is one God. Woohoo! Even the demons believe that and shudder. You both believe truth. Great. Not enough. You foolish person. Ouch, James. Man. Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Yes, we do. Thank you, James. Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete. Say made complete. By what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. I'm going to explain this in a minute, okay? Don't get too nervous. In the same way was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. And here's his final final thought on this. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Oh, wow. This portion of Scripture is robustly theological and yet profoundly applicable. And as much as I would love to tease out all the nuances, I'm going to get right to the meat. Here's the thesis. Knowing the correct information is not the fullness of biblical faith. Knowing the correct information is not the fullness of biblical faith. That's why he said the demons know the foundation of faith. There is one God. He's, he's pointing to the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Even the demons know the foundation of faith, and they shudder, but they don't have the stuff to go with it. So I'm going to quickly unpack for you a little bit of systematic theology on the nature of faith. And here's why this is important. Because so many people think that James and Paul are in contradiction. They are not. Paul is addressing one issue. James is addressing another. And when we look at the nature of faith in an entire systematized way throughout Scripture, we see it's more than just one thing. Okay, there are three elements that I'm going to bring up. Here's the first one. Truth. Truth to know. We could say faith that. This is faith that. It's the body of facts. It's the core truths of the faith. Faith that there is one God who created the cosmos. Faith that Christ is God's son, that he actually died on the cross to redeem us, that he was buried, resurrected on the third day, and ascended into heaven to sit at the right hand of God the Father. The essential facts of the faith. Truth to know. We have to have this. Here's the second thing. We're going to call this heart. This is Christ to trust. We could say faith in. Faith in Christ alone for salvation. If you know those facts, but don't put your faith in the one who is truth, you just have a body of information. That's all you have. Faith in Christ alone for salvation and the entire regeneration of who we are. He gives us a new nature. God changing our hearts. So it's heart. And here's the third one. And we come to James deeds. This is 
life to live. We could call this faith two and faith four. So it's faith to do these things, to activate the law of love, faith to walk in the ways of Jesus, faith to live in righteousness and do justice and mercy, faith to obey the commands of God by the Holy Spirit's power. What we see is that this is a life of faithfulness, which is important. This is a part of faith. Faith is exercised in faithfulness. Faithfulness. But here's the next part. Faith-filledness. Not a real word, but it's fun. So faith-filledness, meaning confidence in God to do what he said he'd do. Faith, that's faith for. Faith for answered prayer. Faith for healing and miracles. Faith for a demonstration of God's power in our lives and world. Each of these is essential to the New Testament concept of faith. You remove one, you don't have the biblical idea of faith. You need all three working together to have what we call believing faith. That's what theologians often call it. Let me show you a diagram that explains it a little bit. We have truth to know up top. We need the body of facts, who Jesus is, what he did for us. Heart, we trust in him because of that body of facts and then deeds. We put our faith to work. Right in the middle is a sweet spot. True believing faith. True believing faith. James, keep that up there for a second, please. James is only addressing the third one. So those are like, wait, I thought we're not saved by works. We're not. James is not contradicting that. He's just only dealing with circle three. He's assuming the clarity of circles one and two. And he's targeting in on circle three. Put your faith to work. Here's his bold claim. Faith without, without action isn't real faith anyway. Because you remove a whole circle. Faith without action isn't real faith anyway. It might be informational agreement. It might be acceptance of a cluster of New Testament facts. But if it's not working, then it's not true, biblical, believing faith. If it's not showing love, giving mercy, doing good, then it's not real faith. And so here is the subtitle of our entire series. Believing faith, then, is working faith. It's a faith that works. That's what it is. It's a faith that works, that does. So here's what we see. Life with Jesus isn't simply a new belief system. It's an entirely different way of thinking, living, and acting. We need all of it. There's a story uh, of a woman who was telling a friend about the first aid training that she had received. And she tells this story that one day there was this terrible car wreck on the street in front of her house. She walked outside to see a man with splintered bones and gaping wounds writhing in a pool of his own blood right out front of her house. And she said, in retelling the story, she said to her friend, and as horrible as it was, in that moment, I remembered my first aid training. That if I put my head between my legs, I wouldn't faint. That's exactly what I did. And I was fine. I'm so glad I took that first aid class. This is an all too true commentary on the dead faith of many Christians through the ages. And it's an illustration of my own failures too. According to the scriptures, knowing the facts without putting them to work is useless. It's like having first aid training and then just taking care of yourself and not responding to the real need, the real dying, bleeding person. Faith without works is dead. So what do we do? Okay, great. Theology, nature of faith, sins aren't equal. Uh, Still mad at you about that one. What do we do about it? We do the stuff Jesus called us to do. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not telling you my life's a model. I'm just telling you it's tough. Yet he still calls us into it, not out of it. Care for the poor, for the broken for the sick, for the widow, for the orphan, for the single mom. Love for your neighbor. Love for the stranger. Love for the foreigner. It's showing mercy to ones in need, to the ones who offend us and frustrate us, to the ones in the highest places of society and those in the lowest places of society. I'm with you. 
this is not easy. It's hard. So you know where we start then? We start with the one. We can get overwhelmed by the systemic issues. God calls some people to address the systems. Thank God. But we're all called to the one. We can't all fix the systems. But we can all love one neighbor. One broken person. One poor person. One homeless person. One single mother. One person down the street. One student who doesn't have what they need. We can all do that. We all must do that. You and I are called to live the life of love. We're called to do the works of faith. We're called to change the world through God's loving kindness. I'm going to close with this quote from St. Teresa of Avila. Famous quote. She says this, Christ has no body on earth but yours. No hands but yours. No feet but yours. Yours are the eyes through which Christ's compassion for the world is to look out. Yours are the feet with which he is to go about doing good. And yours are the hands with which he is to bless us now. You and I are on mission. God's mission. It's his mission to reconcile and redeem all of creation to the glorious purposes of God. It's a revolution of powerful, remarkable, loving kindness. The loving kindness of Jesus. It will change hearts. It will change families. It will change neighborhoods and cities and nations. It will change us. The divine, this divine love will compel us to put our faith to work. Mercy triumphant. Goodwill in action. Jesus victorious. His revolution of loving kindness. Will you stand this morning with me? We're going to close with a very simple response. This is a a song that's about to play, and I want you to listen to the words. And I want you, even more than that, let those words become a vessel through which you can hear the Holy Spirit. How would he call you into knowing his love more? How would he invite you in to receiving the heart of the Father and the compassion of Jesus? How might God be challenging you to lay down something and pick up something else? To love someone else. To be neighborly. To not find your way out. To not find a loophole. But to find your way in and into his love. This is our response for these two weeks. Just open your heart and listen. And then I'm going to close this in prayer. Let me be filled with kindness and compassion for the one, the one in whom you love and gave your son for humanity. Increase my love. Help me to love with all. Oh, they would lay look in my eyes. They would see.
see you Even in just a smile They would feel the Father's love So let all my life tell of who you are And the wonder of your never-ending love Oh, let all my life tell of who you are That you're wonderful and such a good father our prayer this morning. Help us to love with open arms like you do. That's how you've loved us. And that's how you call us to love one another. We cannot do this on our own. We need your heart. We need your compassion. We need your grace and your mercy to love like you do. We confess the struggle. We confess our frailty and our weakness and our shortcomings here. And we ask that you would empower us by your Holy Spirit to do mercy. To live love. To put our faith to work. Even in just a smile, may they see your love. In a kind word, May they see your love. In a meal shared, or gift given, or prayer offered, may they see your love. We believe that your loving kindness, God, can actually change the world. Would you do it through us? Do it through us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Isn't he good? He's so beautiful. He's so kind and loving. Hey, thank you for digging in with me. I know it's a couple tough chunks of scripture here. I'll continue just to seek the Lord. I love you guys. Genuinely, I love you. I'm excited to have Ryan and Lauren back next week. We will not be here. We will be on vacation in a few hours. Hey! Y'all have an awesome week. Be here Wednesday night for uh, Summer Nights. Love you guys. <laughs>